You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of the cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner, entitled According to Luke. This is Lecture 8, entitled Illness and Healing in Luke and in the Evolution of Consciousness. We have been attempting to picture the spiritual foundations of the first few chapters of the Luke Gospel. Understanding the Jesus of Nazareth who received the Cosmic Christ Principle in his thirtieth year requires a thorough discussion of certain processes in human evolution that clarify the meaning of the evangelist's account of events preceding the Christ's incarnation. To understand what the author of the Luke Gospel tells us about the personality and ministry of the Christ Jesus that is, of the individuality who worked on for three years as the Christ in a human body, we must first sketch certain aspects of human evolution that are very difficult to grasp in our time. In many respects, we are extraordinarily short-sighted today. We think that the laws governing human evolution have always been the same as they are now, or at least as they have been for the past two or three centuries. In particular, we are convinced that laws not currently in effect never existed at all. Consequently, accounts of a past as distant as the time when the Christ lived on are very difficult for our contemporaries to understand and accept without bias. If we are receptive to the true meaning of Luke, the evangelist's account of the Christ's deeds, we gain a better and better idea of the state of human evolution at that time. Let's briefly summarize our anthroposophical studies of modern humanity's origins in Atlantis. Our ancestors, that is our own souls in different bodies, lived on the continent of Atlantis which was located west of Europe and Africa and east of America. When the great Atlantean catastrophe transformed the face of the earth, throngs of human beings moved east and west away from Atlantis, populating the post-Atlantean world and founding its successive civilizations, the cultures of ancient India, ancient Persia, Egypt and Chaldea, Greece and Rome, and ultimately the culture we live in today. It is totally false to assume that human beings throughout post-Atlantean times were always the same as they are today. Human nature has undergone tremendous changes. Material historical records document only a few thousand years of human history, however, and only the document we call the Akashic Record which we described briefly earlier in this lecture cycle and which is inaccessible to superficial research, provides insight into all post-Atlantean developments. In the ancient Indian or first post-Atlantean culture, human beings lived primarily in their ether bodies and did not penetrate their physical bodies as strongly as they did later. The ancient Indians did not develop modern eye consciousness, and most of them were dimly clairvoyant. Their consciousness resembled our dream consciousness, but it still reached into the spiritual worlds that underlie our existence. We tend to emphasize our ancient Indian forebears' cognitive processes because understanding these faculties may help us move into the future. We must focus on one of their other attributes, however, if we want to understand the Luke Gospel. In ancient India, the human ether body was much less closely connected to the physical body and extended much further beyond it on all sides than it does today. Soul forces and soul attributes affected the physical body much more strongly. The more the ether body entered the physical body, the weaker it became, 
and the less control it exerted over the physical body. In Atlanteans, and to a certain extent even in ancient Indians, the etheric head still extended far beyond the physical body and permitted the development of both clairvoyant consciousness and a high degree of control over physical bodily processes. Let's consider the differences between an ancient Indian body and a modern body. Although the modern ether body has descended as deeply as possible into the physical body and has united with physical phenomena to the greatest possible extent, we are approaching a time when the ether body will begin to withdraw and become more independent of the physical body. As humankind speeds toward the future, the ether body will continue to withdraw from the physical body. Today we are slightly past the nadir of the ether body's closest association with the physical body. Compared to a modern body, the ancient Indian ether body was still relatively free of the physical body, and the Indian soul developed forces that influenced the physical body. Because it was not so closely bound to the physical body, the ether body absorbed soul forces and exerted more control over the physical body. Consequently, anything that affected the soul also affected the physical body to a very great extent. Modern ether bodies no longer have this ability. In ancient India, a hate-filled word spoken by one person actually pierced its recipient, working right into the structure of the physical body. In contrast, a loving word had an expansive, warming effect on the recipient's soul and physical body. The soul still influenced the physical body via the ether body. At that time, the difference between a hate-filled word and a loving word was very important because words directly affected bodily processes. This effect lessened as the human ether body descended further into the physical body and today the situation is different. Today our words initially affect only the recipient's soul and very few people still experience a hateful or unloving word as binding and constricting, or a loving word as expansive and blessing. In the early stages of post-Atlantean evolution, the unique effects of loving or hateful words, which we can still sense today in our physical hearts, were much more intense and could be manipulated very differently. How a word is spoken is no longer crucially important today. No matter how warmly a word is spoken, it more or less bounces off when it strikes a modern human constitution. The depth to which it penetrates now depends not only on how it is spoken, but also on the body's ability to receive it. Today it is impossible to work so directly on the human soul that our words also penetrate the body's physical structure. In the future, such effects will become possible, however, because the spirit will regain its significance. Let me suggest briefly what this future will be like. We can accomplish very little in this regard in our present incarnation cycle because the love, goodwill and wisdom that live in a human soul cannot pour directly into another soul where it might acquire the strength to affect the physical body. Today we know that we are, will only gradually learn to produce such spiritual effects. They are beginning to develop again, however, especially wherever the seeds of the spiritual scientific worldview are planted. Today words very seldom have physical effects. Individuals can, however, come together to receive a number of spiritual truths that will gradually gain the strength required to shape the physical body in their own image. In the future the soul spiritual element 
will once again acquire a great deal of power over the physical element. In the original Indian culture of ancient times, for example, so-called healing was different from what it would later become, as you may suspect from what we have just heard. Because anything that affected the soul also had tremendous effects on the body, a word imbued with the right will impulse could stimulate another person's soul to affect the physical body via the ether body. By exerting the right effect on another person's soul, you could work on a diseased constitution and restore health right down to the level of the physical body. Indian physicians cultivated this ability to the utmost. Above all, they mastered the necessary soul effects. We must realize that in ancient India, healing was a much more spiritual process than it can possibly be today. We are beginning to rediscover such ways of working, however. A worldview brought down from cosmic spiritual heights, a sum of truths corresponding to the great spiritual contents of the cosmos will flow into human souls. As humankind moves toward the future, this worldview will become a means of healing that works outward from within. In the future, spiritual science will be a great remedy for human souls. We must understand, however, that humankind is now at the nadir of a descending path of evolution, that spiritual effects have increasingly receded, and that we will only gradually be able to return to the heights we once occupied. The effects that were so prominent in ancient India were lost very slowly. A similar human constitution, which permitted one soul to affect another, still persisted in ancient Egypt. As we go further back in Egyptian culture, we discover more direct soul-to-soul -soul effects that could then be transferred to the physical body. Such effects were much less common in ancient Persian culture, which had a different calling, namely to provide the initial impetus for mastering the physical environment. With regard to the characteristics I just described, Egyptian culture is much closer to India than to Persia. In Persia, souls were meant to develop self-awareness and therefore became increasingly self-contained and lost control of the physical body. Thus the spiritual current that maintained the spirit's mastery over physical matter had to flow into a different culture, one that was concerned primarily with awakening self-awareness through inner contemplation. A balance between these two currents emerged in what we call Greco-Roman civilization in the fourth post-Atlantean cultural period. At that point, humankind had descended deeply enough into the physical world to establish a balance of sorts between the physical element and the soul spiritual element. That is, in this fourth cultural period, the soul and spirit controlled the body to roughly the same extent that the body controlled the soul. Humankind had descended to a state of balance. In our time, however, humankind must first undergo a cosmic test to be able to return to spiritual heights. That is why we have descended still deeper into physical matter since Greco-Roman times. All aspects of our bodily, physical nature have continued to descend. In the fifth post-Atlantean cultural epoch, we have been driven below the balance point at the moment, the only upward steps that are open to us are the inner steps of strengthening ourselves inwardly and cultivating a rather theoretical knowledge of the spiritual world. In contrast to Greco-Roman culture, which represented a relatively balanced state, the physical element has gained the upper hand 
and dominates the sole spiritual element in our culture. In a certain respect, the sole spiritual element has fallen unconscious. We can absorb it only theoretically. For centuries, inner human nature has been restricted to strengthen, strengthening itself in ways not apparent to manifest consciousness. Our inner aspect must gradually become stronger so we can develop a new awareness of it. In the sixth post-Atlantean cultural period, when our soul spiritual element has achieved a certain strength, it will possess the living truth, not merely a theoretical truth, about the spiritual nourishment that we take in to an increasing extent. The spiritual will grow strong enough to master the physical body again, this time from the opposite direction. From this perspective, how can we explain the mission of spiritual science on behalf of humanity? If spiritual science increasingly becomes a living reality in our time, warming the soul as well as stimulating human reason or intellect, the soul will grow strong enough to regain mastery over the physical element. Of course, there will be transitional stages, some of which will seem regressive or even harmful, but they will eventually make way for a time when human beings will imbue their ideas with the spirit's life. In all human beings, the soul spiritual element will master the physical material element. Any individual who not only is interested in spiritual scientific wisdom as an intellectual stimulus, but also delights in spiritual scientific truths and takes deep and vital satisfaction in them, is a precursor to the souls who will once again achieve their rightful mastery over the body. The progressive step we can take already today is to introduce great truths about mighty events such as those in Palestine just before the confluence of the Buddha and Zarathustra elements at the beginning of the Christian era. In the last few days we described how the wisdom guiding world progress produced the Nathanic and Solomonic Jesus children and paved the way for the confluence of these cosmic currents which had previously flowed separately. Two views are possible about the content we absorbed in the last few days. Some people may assess it rationally and conclude that while it all seems somewhat fantastical to modern consciousness, it seems quite plausible when weighed against external events. Such people may reason that the Gospels become comprehensible only when we assume the truth of the Akashic Record. They may be interested in what was said about the two Jesus figures and find that it satisfies their curiosity and explains previously inexplicable phenomena. Others may be left with an impression of the indescribable beauty of the events of cosmic evolution documented by esoteric research, of the wondrous descent of the Buddha's Nirmanakaya, the spiritual foundation of the Annunciation to the Shepherds, of the star that guided Zarathustra's followers to where their leader was reborn, or the confluence of cosmic currents that formerly ran separately. Excuse me, of the confluence of cosmic currents that formerly ran separately. Learning about these c events may leave us with an impression of great glory, power and grandeur. The truth about cosmic events sets our souls afire and makes us glow with enthusiasm. Small truths satisfy our thirst for knowledge, but great truths warm our souls and reveal the immense beauty of cosmic events. When we sense their beauty and glory, knowledge begins to take root in us and to transcend mere theoretical understanding. After all, what does Christ Jesus say in the Luke Gospel? Quote, 
A sower went out to seed his seed. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path, and was trodden underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil, and grew, and yielded a hundredfold. Close quote Luke 8, 5 to 8. The explanation Christ Jesus gave his disciples of the parable of the sower also applies to anthroposophy. The seed is the kingdom of the gods, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the spirit, which is meant to fall like a seed into human souls. An individual's soul forces may repel the spiritual worldview or the kingdom of divine spiritual beings. This seed is consumed by obstacles in the human soul, is rejected immediately before it can germinate, or is eaten by birds before it works its way into the soil. Many people heard and rejected the words of Christ Jesus, and many today hear and reject Anthroposophy's gift to the world. These same words, however, either the words of Christ Jesus or words of spiritual wisdom, may also be heard by souls not deep enough to receive them. Such a soul may be prepared to hear, understand, and acknowledge the truth, and even to pass it on to others, yet remain unable to unite with it. This truth is like the seed that falls on the rocks and cannot sprout. Other seeds fall among brambles where they sprout but cannot thrive. As Christ Jesus explained, this means that some human souls are so preoccupied with ordinary life and its cares that even though they understand the word of spiritual truth, their other soul content is like a bramble patch that hampers its growth. Many souls today cannot overcome the outer obstacles to acquiring spiritual scientific truths. Only a few can allow such truths to unfold freely like seed that falls on good soil. These souls begin to sense the living truth of anthroposophy, absorb its living element, and dwell in it completely. Such individuals presage the future efficacy of spiritual truths. We learn to trust spiritual wisdom and become convinced of its effectiveness only through personal inner soul strength. No outer means can convince us of its truth and power. Spiritual wisdom still has no positive physical effects on many people today. Does this mean that it is ineffective? On the contrary, the negative effects it may have on the mighty physical bodies it encounters simply prove its inherent health. A child in poor physical health, weakened by breathing city air from infancy, may become really sick instead of healthy when exposed to clean mountain air. This does not prove that mountain air is unhealthy, nor does the fact that spiritual wisdom may cause temporary damage in certain human constitutions prove that it is harmful or ineffective. Spiritual truths encounter hundreds and thousands of years of physical heredity that is not suited to receive them. In this context, we cannot look for proof in the outer world. We must thoroughly investigate spiritual wisdom and convince ourselves of its truth. Regardless of outer indications of its truth, we must be able to penetrate its inner aspect and develop a personal conviction. If anthroposophical wisdom sometimes seems overly aggressive, that is because it encounters unhealthy circumstances in human beings. Spiritual wisdom is perfectly healthy, but human beings are not. That is why the spiritual wisdom that will be revealed in the course of time cannot be disclosed today in its entirety and all at once. We must avoid causing excessive damage. 
We cannot send city children out into the mountain air that sears their lungs. It is only possible to convey as much as human beings, on the average, can bear. If still deeper wisdom were revealed, individuals with certain constitutions might collapse under the burden, just as their physical health might be disturbed in mountain air. The greatest wisdom can be disclosed to humankind only gradually. It will eventually be disclosed, however, and will become a comprehensive source of healing. These considerations underlie the so-called spiritual scientific movement. From ancient India to Greco-Roman times, the human soul and spirit gradually lost their mastery over matter, and we must now regain it. As late as Greece and Rome, some individuals still experienced the loosening of the ether body from the physical body. Consequently, their entire constitutions were receptive to soul spiritual effects. That is why Christ Jesus appeared at that particular time. If he appeared today, he would not be able to work as he did then, or to offer the same great example. In our time he would encounter human constitutions that have descended much more deeply into physical matter and can no longer be as powerfully influenced by the soul and spirit. And he himself would have had to incarnate into such a physical constitution. This perspective applies not only to Christ Jesus but also to similar phenomena in humankind's evolution such as the Buddha's appearance. We saw that the Buddha's mission was to introduce the great doctrine of love, compassion, and all related virtues included in the Eightfold Path. Do you think that if the Buddha appeared today, he would be able to fulfill that mission in the same way? He would not. No modern human constitution would permit the Buddha to undergo developments that were still possible in his time. Human physical constitutions have evolved, continued to evolve, and the exemplary constitution that allowed the Buddha to incarnate was possible only at a very specific point in time. He used this constitution to perform a mighty deed namely to exemplify the Eightfold Path for all human beings to emulate. Today we are meant to gradually acquire the Eightfold Path through soul-spiritual means. The statement may sound strange, but it is really true. All our philosophical and moral accomplishments to date are only a feeble step toward achieving what the Buddha first introduced. No matter how much we may admire the philosophies of Kant and others, they are elementary and fragmentary in comparison to the comprehensive principles of the Eightfold Path. We will only gradually ascend to a level that allows us to understand what underlies the words of the Eightfold Path. Each new element in human evolution is first introduced as a mighty deed that serves as a starting point for further evolution. A long time passes before we successfully emulate the model presented symbolically in that deed. In his own time the Buddha introduced the doctrine of love and compassion as a sign for future generations who will gradually recognize the Eightfold Path in themselves. In the sixth cultural epoch a fair number of people will be able to do this, but we have a long way to go before our souls resemble the Buddhas and we all internalize what he introduced symbolically five or six centuries before Christ. A few contemporaries of the individual who first introduces a new element in human evolution are born with the ability to understand it but the remaining great majority of human beings ascends slowly toward the goal and achieves it only much later. When many people have understood the Eightfold Path from within, rather than by hearing about it from Buddhism, 
a great deal will have been accomplished with regard to individual inner development. In the chapter on the effects of initiation in my book titled How to Know Higher Worlds, you can read about the relationship between the Eightfold Path and the Sixteen-Petaled Lotus Flower. The Eightfold Path will enable individuals to develop the Sixteen-Petaled Lotus Flower. The two are intimately related. The Sixteen-Petaled Lotus Flower is one of the first organs that people will learn to use in the future. So for those who can survey human evolution, its degree or development indicates the extent to which humankind has evolved. Fully developing this organ establishes a certain mastery of the soul spiritual element over the physical. Only those committed to esoteric spiritual development are truly engaged in internalizing the Eightfold Path. Others merely study it, which is also valuable as a stimulus. As we see, the soul-spiritual element essentially becomes active only in individuals who begin to organically unite the spiritual wisdom they receive with their own souls. To the extent that the Eightfold Path becomes a matter of personal experience, it works back on the physical body. To be sure, clever and modern materialists may tell us, for example, that they knew someone who cultivated spiritual development but died at age 50, so the spiritual truths he brought to life in himself did little to prolong his life. What they say is quite true, this is a familiar phenomenon. It is simply unfortunate that no opposing evidence is presented. For instance, how long would the person in question have lived if he had not undergone a course of spiritual development? Perhaps he would only have lived to be forty. This issue would have to be resolved first. People always simply affirm what actually happens and disregard what would have happened otherwise, which is crucial in understanding such matters. Within humankind, soul-spiritual mastery of the physical element receded during the fourth cultural epoch. The Christ had to appear when enough people could still demonstrate the Spirit's effect on matter. If he had come later, he would not have been able to do what he did. His appearance was sorely needed, but it had to occur at the right time. What is the significance of the Christ's incarnation? By truly understanding the Christ, we learn to exert our full self-awareness or I consciousness. The human eye learns to master all other aspects of the human being. That was the purpose of the Christ's appearance. The self-aware I will regain everything that humankind has lost through the ages. Just as the Eightfold Path had to be introduced by the Buddha, however, I mastery over all external bodily processes also had to be introduced in visible form before ancient times drew to a close. If the Christ principle entered the world in our time, it would not have the same mighty healing effects on its surroundings. It had to appear when human ether bodies still extended far enough to receive the mighty effects of the Christ's mere word or touch. At best, only faint echoes of such effects are possible today. Along with the eye, humankind began to develop an understanding of the Christ, which will become a point of departure for regaining everything humankind once lost. The few remaining receptive individuals demonstrated the powerful effects of the Christ eye on its contemporaries. At that time the I was fully present only in the Christ, but it will be present in all human beings at the end of the phase of evolution. As the Luke Gospel shows, the Christ I, capital of course, 
pervaded the human physical, etheric, and astral bodies so thoroughly that it exerted healing effects on the entire bodily constitutions of others. This phenomenon exemplified the strength that each human eye will acquire in future millennia, when all will be able to induce effects that once emanated only from the Christ. The effects of the ideal eye could be introduced to humankind only at that particular time and had to be demonstrated through many different examples. Luke shows us examples of diseases that originate in the human astral body. How they manifest relates to the individual's entire being. In modern human beings, questionable moral qualities may be no more than soul deep. Because modern souls do not master the body to the extent possible in the time of Christ Jesus, sins are less easily expressed as physical illnesses. But we are gradually approaching the time when the ether body will re-emerge from the physical body, when we will have to prevent moral and intellectual vices from manifesting in physical illness. This time is already beginning, as indicated by many modern nervous disorders, which are half psychological and half physical. When our thinking and perceptions absorb unharmonious aspects of our environment, the natural consequences are symptoms such as hysteria. These symptoms, however, relate to the unique quality of the spiritual evolution that we are beginning to undergo, namely the re-emergence of the ether body. When the Christ appeared, he encountered many people whose illnesses expressed their sins, that is, character defects based on unfortunate traits in earlier incarnations. In the Luke Gospel, a defect in the astral body that appears as an illness is called possession, which means that foreign spirits enter the astral body of an individual whose better qualities do not maintain mastery over his or her full humanity. In the many human beings who still experienced the old separation of the ether body from the physical body, negative character traits frequently manifested as possession. The Luke Gospel gives examples of people healed by the touch and word of the Christ individuality who drove out the evil in them. The Christ presented an example of the healing effects that positive qualities will exert by the end of evolution. We usually do not notice the subtle differences in these healings that suggest the different type of illness involved. An example of this is the healing of the palsied man, Luke 5.17-26, which should actually be called the healing of the paralytic, because the Greek text uses, uses the word paralleluminos, which means someone whose limbs are paralyzed. In those times, people still knew that such illnesses originated in characteristics of the ether body. That Christ Jesus healed people who were paralyzed tells us that the forces of his individuality affected not only astral bodies, but also ether bodies, so that individuals with defective ether bodies could also experience his healing influence. The words that the Christ uses to indicate deep-seated sin in the ether body are noteworthy. The spiritual element that causes sickness must be banished first. So the Christ, instead of immediately telling the sick man to get up and walk, first addresses the cause, which works right down into the ether body. He says, Your sins are forgiven you. That is, the sins that have eaten their way into your ether body must be eliminated first. Ordinary Bible scholarship does not pursue these finer distinctions and thus fails to recognize 
that the individuality of the Christ influenced the mysteries of both the astral body and the ether body, and even the mysteries of the physical body itself. Why does this chapter seem to speak of the mysteries of the physical body as uppermost, when, even in our physical existence, the effect of one astral body on another is the most readily apparent? When you hurt someone with a hate-filled word, a process is triggered in the recipient's astral body, where the offending word is experienced as suffering. This is an example of an exchange between astral bodies. Exchanges between etheric bodies are much more hidden and involve more subtle interpersonal effects that are generally disregarded today. Effects on the physical body are the most heavily concealed, however, because dense matter effectively insulates the physical body from spiritual effects. However, we are also meant to see that Christ Jesus mastered the physical body. How does he demonstrate his mastery? At this point, we open a chapter that will be totally incomprehensible to modern materialistic thinkers. Fortunately, all of you are knowledgeable about spiritual science. To anyone coming in from the street, what we are discussing today would sound totally insane, even if only half or a quarter of the previous lectures sounded crazy. Christ Jesus demonstrated his ability to understand and influence human physical bodily nature. His strength cured diseases rooted in the physical body. To understand this, we must be aware of the mysterious effects that work from one physical body to another to alleviate physical illness. When spiritual effects come into play, we cannot consider the human being as confined within the skin. We have often said that each one of our fingers is wiser than we are. Blood flows through a finger only because it flows through the entire body in the right way, and a finger knows that it will atrophy if separated from the rest of the body. If we truly understood the situation in our body, we would know that the physical body belongs to humankind as a whole, that effects constantly pass from one physical body to the other, and that we cannot separate the health of a single human being from the health of humankind as a whole. Today we acknowledge the truth of this statement with regard to crude effects, but not with regard to more subtle effects, because we cannot know the real situation. The Luke Gospel, however, points out these more subtle effects. Chapter 8 tells of events leading up to the curing of the twelve-year-old daughter of Jairus. Quote, now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he besought him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she was dying. As he went, the people pressed round him, and a woman who had had a flow of blood for twelve years and could not be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood ceased. Luke 8, 40-44, close quote. How could the girl be cured if she was dying? To understand this, we must know that her physical illness was related to another person's symptoms and could not be cured without taking them into account. The girl now twelve was born with a deep karmic connection to another personality. We are told that a woman who had suffered from her particular disorder for twelve years approached the Christ from behind and touched the hem of his garment. This woman is mentioned here because she was karmically linked to Jairus's daughter. It is no coincidence that the girl was dying at age twelve and that the woman had been sick for twelve years. 
their conditions are related. The woman approached Jesus and was cured. Only then could he enter Jairus' house and cure his daughter, who was already presumed dead. Grasping the karma that weaves between individuals requires a very profound perspective. In this example we can see the Christ's third means of working, namely on the entire human constitution. We must keep it in mind as the Luke Gospel reveals the Christ's higher activity. The Luke Gospel illustrates how the I-being of the Christ influenced all other members of the human constitution. This is the important aspect of these accounts. The author of the Luke Gospel emphasized healing effects and attempted to show how they reveal an I at the pinnacle of human evolution. He shows the inevitable effects of the Christ on the human astral body, ether body, and physical body. Luke introduced the great model for our future evolution, telling us that the human eye, still weak today, will gradually master and transform the astral body, the ether body, and the physical body. The Christ appeared as the great ideal to which humankind must aspire. He shows us the results of the eye's mastery over the other members of the human constitution. Such are the truths underlying the Gospels, which are based not on other documents, but on the testimony of, quote, independent seers, close quote, and, quote, servants of the word, close quote. Only gradually will humanity grow convinced of what lies behind the Gospels. Then, with a strength and intensity that will truly affect all other members of the human constitution, we will progressively internalize the scripture's substance. That is the end of Lecture 8, given in Basel on September 24, 1909. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner, entitled According to Luke. This is Lecture 9, entitled Christ and Maitreya Buddha. As you will have gathered from yesterday's lecture, we can understand a document like the Luke Gospel only by applying the higher perspective supplied by spiritual science to the evolution of the entire human constitution. To understand the Luke Gospel, we must first understand the radical change that occurred in humankind at the time of Christ Jesus. It will be helpful to compare this change to one that is taking place in our own time. This latter change, although more gradual, is clearly evident. But to understand it, we must abandon a very prevalent and comfortable bias, namely that no great leaps occur in nature or in evolution. From the ordinary perspective, there is nothing more false than this statement. Nature constantly takes leaps. Leaps are the very essence of development. For example, let's look at how a seed sprouts. The emergence of the first leaf constitutes a significant leap forward. Another leap occurs in the transition from leaf to flower. Another in the transition from the outer to the inner parts of the flower. And another very significant leap occurs when the fruit develops. We cannot understand nature if we fail to consider such leaps. Having observed evolution progressing at a snail's pace in one century, we would be mistaken to assume that the rate of change will always remain the same. At certain times evolution may proceed slowly, as when a plant moves from one green leaf to the next. A leap occurs in the plant, however, when the last leaf has emerged and flower buds begin to form and comparable repeated leaps occur in the evolution of the human race. One such significant leap occurred at the time when Christ Jesus appeared. In a relatively short time, 
the properties of ancient clairvoyance and the spirit's mastery over the bodily element were transformed and nearly eliminated. Before this transition occurred, the legacy of ancient times asserted itself one final time. This was the context of Christ Jesus' work which enabled humankind to absorb a new element and slowly, gradually evolve further. In a different domain, a leap is also occurring now. Although more gradual, it is quite comprehensible to those who want to understand our time. We can best gain an idea of this change by listening to people who approach spiritual science from different spiritual perspectives. Not infrequently, for example, members of various religious denominations attend lectures on spiritual science. What I am going to say next is completely understandable and is not intended as a reproach. When these people attend spiritual scientific lectures on the nature of Christianity, their response is often, quote, that's all well and good, and it doesn't really contradict anything we hear from the pulpit. But we say it in ways that everyone can understand. In contrast, what we just heard is understandable to only a few. Close quote. This very common response implies that their view of Christianity is the only view. Such people disregard a universal obligation to judge on the basis of facts rather than personal preference. I once had to say to such a person, quote, you may believe that you proclaim Christian truths to all people. However, this issue is decided by the facts, not by your belief. Does everyone attend your church? The facts demonstrate the opposite. Spiritual science is not there for those for whom your approach is adequate. It is there for those who need something different, close quote. We must judge on the basis of facts rather than personal preference, and as a general rule it is very difficult for people to distinguish their preferences from fact. What would happen if such people persisted in believing that their approach is right for all, and continued to harangue all who speak differently? Would spiritual life survive at all? An increasing number of people would no longer be able to hear spiritual facts proclaimed in traditional ways. Fewer and fewer people would even bother to listen to such proclamations. And if there were no spiritual scientific movement, these people would have nothing to satisfy their spiritual needs and would fade away for lack of nourishment. How to present spiritual nourishment is no longer a matter of individual choice, but a matter for evolution to determine. In our current time and situation, people's spiritual needs with regard to interpreting the Gospels and so on must be satisfied. How we choose to provide spiritual nourishment, however, is not the point. The point is how human be souls ask for it. Today, their longing for spiritual science is evident. Whether those who choose to teach in other ways will be able to meet the spiritual needs of our time is no longer up to them. They will simply find themselves with ever fewer listeners. In our time, it is becoming ever less possible for human hearts to accept the Bible as it was accepted in the last four or five centuries of Western cultural history. Either humankind will receive spiritual science and learn to understand the Bible in new ways, or non-anthroposophists will no longer be able to listen to the Bible. In the latter case, humankind will lose the Bible completely. It will disappear, and with it the greatest spiritual treasures of earthly evolution we are facing an evolutionary leap. 
human hearts are asking for a spiritual, scientific explanation of the Bible. If they get it, the blessings of the Bible will be preserved for humankind. If not, the Bible will be lost. People who believe that their preferences and their traditional way of reading the Bible absolutely must be preserved will have to accept this state of affairs and the leap that we can take in our time. If we recognize this leap, we also acknowledge the spiritual scientific movement as a necessity in human evolution and will not be dissuaded from cultivating anthroposophy. From a higher perspective, the leap that is occurring now is relatively small compared to the one that occurred when Christ Jesus appeared on earth. At that time, humankind was in the last throes of an evolutionary phase begun in ancient times, in fact in the earth's previous embodiment. Throughout that entire time, most of human evolution involved the physical, etheric and astral bodies. The capital I, although it had since been part of the human constitution, still played a subordinate role. Until Christ Jesus appeared, the completely self-aware uh, human eye was still overshadowed by its three protective coverings. What would have happened if Christ Jesus had not come to earth? Human evolution would have progressed until the eye emerged fully but as the eye emerged, all the earlier outstanding capabilities of the astral, etheric and physical bodies would have disappeared. All ancient clairvoyance, all mastery of soul and spirit over the body would have had to disappear. The human being would have become an increasingly self-aware but increasingly egotistical eye, and all the love on earth would have died out. It is essential to note this point. At the time of Christ Jesus, humankind was ready to develop the I or self, but had transcended old forms of influence from outside. In ancient Hebrew culture, for example, the law proclaimed from Mount Sinai was effective because the I had not yet fully emerged. The astral body as the highest fully present member was receptive to having appropriate behaviors and feelings imbued or imprinted from outside. For the last time, before the eye's full emergence, the law streamed into human beings from outside. If the eye had emerged and nothing else had happened, human beings would have focused exclusively on the eye. Although humankind was ready for eye development, the eye would have become empty, thinking only of itself, and wanting to do nothing for other people or for the wider world. Christ's deed on earth was to provide content for the eye, to inspire the eye to learn to overflow with the power of love. Without the Christ, the eye would have been an empty vessel through his appearance, it is increasingly filled with love. That is why the Christ said to those around him, When you see clouds gathering, you know a storm is coming. You judge the weather on the basis of physical signs, but you do not understand the signs of the times. Luke 1254 54-59 If you understood them and were able to judge what happens around you, you would know that the divinity has must pervade and impregnate the I. And you would not say that you can continue to live with what has come down from the past. The scribes and Pharisees offer you an outdated legacy and want to add nothing to it. Their leaven, however, will no longer work in human evolution. Those who choose to abide by Moses and the prophets do not understand the signs of the times and do not recognize the transition occurring in humankind. 
In significant words, Christ Jesus told those around him that being Christian is not a matter of personal preference, but a necessity for human progress. In the speeches preserved in the Luke Gospel about the signs of the time and about the inadequacy of the old leaven of the scribes and Pharisees, who wanted only to preserve the old ways, the Christ explains that the old leaven seems adequate only to those who judge exclusively on the basis of personal preference and feel no obligation to judge according to the necessities of world evolution that he was teaching. For this reason the Christ called the aim of the scribes and Pharisees an untruth in the sense of something that no longer corresponds to the outer world. We can best sense the emotional power of his speech by comparing it to corresponding processes in our time. How would it sound if what the Christ Jesus said about the scribes and Pharisees were transposed to our time? Are there people today who are like the scribes? Indeed there are. They choose not to participate in a deeper explanation of the Gospels, to go no further than what faculties acquired without benefit of spiritual science tell them about the Gospels. They do not want to move toward understanding the depths of the Gospels as spiritual science teaches us to do. This resistance is basically the same wherever people attempt to interpret the Gospels whether in progressive or regressive ways. The ability to interpret the Gospels emerges only from spiritual science, because spiritual science alone can help us learn the truth about the Gospels. All other scriptural research seems futile and leaves real truth-seekers cold. Today, however, we must add to the scribes and Pharisees a third category of people, the natural scientists, who reject all the acquired faculties that enable us to research the spiritual foundations of natural phenomena. Today when we speak as Christ Jesus might have spoken, we confront academics whose function is to categorize natural phenomena. They reject all spiritual explanations and hamper the progress of human evolution by refusing to recognize the signs of the times in the sense described above. Christ Jesus found the courage to speak out against those who acknowledged only Moses and the prophets. In our time, following in his footsteps would entail finding the courage as he found the courage to speak out against those who acknowledged only Moses and the prophets, to speak out against all those who want to turn back the clock on human progress by opposing at the philosophical interpretation of both the scriptures and natural phenomena. The well-intentioned few who make vague attempts to keep the peace should take to heart what Christ Jesus says in the Luke Gospel about the impossibility of serving two masters. Among the most beautiful and compelling parables in the Luke Gospel is the one usually called the parable of the unjust steward, Luke 16, 1-13. It tells of a rich man who decided to dismiss a steward who was rumored to be squandering his fortune. The steward was extremely perturbed and wondered what to do next since he did not know how to work the land and was too ashamed to beg. Then he thought of a way out of his predicament. He realized that his business associates did not like him because he had consistently put his master's interest above theirs in all his dealings with them. To avoid absolute ruin, he had to gain their favor and demonstrate his goodwill. So he went to one of his master's debtors, asked how much he owed, and allowed him to write off half of the debt. He did the same thing with all the others, seeking to gain their goodwill, 
so that when his master dismissed him he could turn to them and would not have to starve. Such was his reasoning. Then the Gospel says something that may astonish some readers. Quote, the master commended the dishonest steward for his shrewdness. Close quote. Some modern interpreters of the Gospel expressed doubt about who this master might be, even though it is quite clear that Jesus himself praised the steward's shrewdness. The Gospel continues, quote, For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Close quote. Luke 16.8 These words have stood there in the Bible for hundreds of years. Why has no one questioned the meaning of this verse? Quote, in their generation, close quote, appears in all the different translations of the Bible. But the correct translation of the Greek text is, quote, for the children of this world are wiser in their own way than the children of light, close quote. In other words, according to their own understanding of the situation, the children of this world are wiser. For centuries, all the translators mistranslated, quote, in their own way, close quote, because the Greek phrase ten genian sounds very similar to the Greek word for generation, and is even used in that sense in some cases. How can an error like this persist for centuries? Even Weizsäcker, a recent translator who reputedly went to great lengths to recreate the correct wording, goes along with it. Strangely enough, people seem to forget all their education when they try to establish authoritative versions of the scriptures. Above all, the spiritual scientific worldview will give us back the Bible as it really is. The Bible we have today is not the real Bible, and we cannot imagine what the books of the Bible are really like. Their most important passages are not accurate, as I will now demonstrate in greater detail. The intended meaning of the parable of the unjust steward is clearly stated in the Luke Gospel. The steward, reflecting on his imminent dismissal, realized that he had to win favor among people and that he could not serve two masters. The Christ then tells his listeners that they too cannot serve two masters. They cannot serve both the God who is trying to win their hearts and the God proclaimed by the scribes and the interpreters of the prophets. We cannot serve both the Christ principle which is working to bring human evolution a step forward and the God who attempts to obstruct progressive evolution. When it persists into later times, everything that was right in times past eventually becomes an obstacle to later evolution. This is a basic premise of evolution. In Jesus' time, mammon was a technical term for the powers of obstruction. You cannot serve both the God of progress and mammon the god of obstruction. The steward, that, quote, child of this world, close quote, realized that even mammon does not allow one to serve two masters, and those who aspire to becoming children of light must also realize that they cannot serve two masters. How can we clothe this parable in Christian terms appropriate to our time? Modern human beings must realize that no compromise is possible between the modern mammon, that is, traditional scholars and scientists, and the current that must provide nourishment for humankind. Our understanding of the Gospels must come alive, as must spiritual science itself. Everything spiritual science touches must come to life, and the Gospels must fructify our spiritual faculties. Simply talking about Christ Jesus' repudiation of the scribes and Pharisees is not enough, because by doing so, we refer again to a time that is now past. We must enliven our understanding by learning to recognize the contemporary, 
living manifestations and successors of what Christ Jesus, using the vocabulary of his time, called mammon. Both our recognition of the contemporary mammon and the parable of the steward, which is told only in the Luke Gospel, relate to one of the most important concepts in the Gospels. We can understand this concept with heart, soul and mind only by considering the Buddha's impact on Christ Jesus from a different perspective. We said that the Buddha introduced the great doctrine of compassion and love to humankind. In cases like this, esoteric statements must be taken very precisely. Otherwise, someone might say that I contradicted myself by saying on one occasion that the Christ brought love to earth and on another that the Buddha brought the doctrine of love. But are these two statements the same? In one instance I said that the Buddha brought the doctrine of love to earth and in the other that the Christ brought the living power of love to earth. There is a big difference between these statements. When humankind's most profound concerns are involved, we must listen very carefully, because otherwise people compare statements made on two different occasions and then say that I postulated two proclaimers of love in order to satisfy everyone. In esotericism, exact listening is important. When we truly understand the significant truths clothed in these words, we will see them in the right light. We know that the Eightfold Path completely encompasses all of the Buddha's great doctrine of compassion and love. What is the goal or destination of this path? When individuals commit themselves from the depths of their souls to the ideal of the Eightfold Path, they begin to explore what they need to do to become as perfect as possible, to cleanse and purify the I to the greatest possible extent, and to allow it to find its right place in the world. The aim of the Eightfold Path is to purify and ennoble the I, which is perfected by fully observing the path's precepts. As the I works to perfect itself, the individual incorporates everything that emanates from this wondrous path. This is the most essential aspect of the Eightfold Path. If humankind continues to cultivate what the Buddha, using a technical term called, quote, rolling the wheel of the law, close quote, each of us will gradually perfect our own I and learn to recognize the most perfect I beings by their thoughts and wisdom. The Buddha gave humankind knowledge of love and compassion. And when we have completely transformed our astral bodies through the Eightfold Path, we will know everything we need to know about the law of this path. There is a difference, however, between wisdom, knowledge, or thoughts and an active living force. There is a difference between knowing what an I should be like and imbuing ourselves with a living force that can then flow from the I into the entire world, as the force emanating from the Christ influenced the astral, etheric and physical bodies of those around him. Humankind learned the content of the doctrine of compassion and love through the contribution of the great Buddha. In contrast, the Christ's contribution is not a doctrine, but a living force. He sacrificed himself and descended to earth to pervade not only the astral body, but also the eye, teaching it to exude the substance of love. The Christ brought to earth love's substantial living content, not merely its wise content. This is the essence of his mission. The great Buddha lived on earth approximately 2,500 years ago. As esoteric facts 
teach us, the earth phase of evolution, will last for approximately another 3,000 years. At that time, large numbers of people will have discovered and followed the Eightfold Path, the Buddha's wisdom, in their own hearts and souls. The Buddha's life on earth served as a starting point for the force that human beings would gradually develop as knowledge of the Eightfold Path. Let me read that again. The Buddha's life on earth started as a, served as a starting point for the force that human beings would gradually develop as knowledge of the Eightfold Path. In approximately 3,000 years, human beings will internalize it fully. Individuals will no longer receive the Buddha's teachings from outside, but will discover them within themselves, allowing the Eightfold Path to grow and emerge as the wisdom of compassion and love. Even if nothing further had happened after the great Buddha set the wheel of the law in motion, humankind would still acquire knowledge of the doctrine of compassion and love in the next 3,000 years. There is a difference, however, between knowing about this doctrine and acquiring the strength to embody it and live it. There is a difference between knowing about compassion and love and developing the corresponding power under the influence of the Christ individuality who poured love into human beings. This love will continue to grow. Thanks to the Buddha, when this phase of our evolution is complete, we will have the wisdom to recognize the content of the doctrine of compassion and love. Thanks to the Christ, we will have learned to allow love to flow from the individual I to all humankind. Described in this way, the interaction of the Christ and the Buddha makes the Luke Gospel understandable. We encounter their interaction as soon as we learn to correctly interpret the words of Luke 2, 13-14. Down below are the shepherds, hurrying to receive the proclamation. Above them is the heavenly host, the spiritual imaginative expression of the Buddha's Nirmanakaya. Divine wisdom is revealed from the heights by the Buddha's Nirmanakaya, which hovers over the Nathanic infant Jesus in the form of the angelic host. Something else, however, is added to this revelation, quote, Peace to human beings on earth below, who are imbued with goodwill, close quote. That is, to human beings in whom the true, living force of love begins to grow. This state of peace on earth will be realized through the impetus the Christ provided. To the revelation from the heights, he added a living force that flowed into every human heart, where it can increase to the point of overflowing. The Christ provided no mere doctrine to be absorbed in the form of thoughts and ideas, but a force that will flow from human souls. The Luke Gospel and the other Gospels consistently describe the Christ force that works in human souls as the force of faith. That is the meaning of faith in the Gospels. Those who receive the Christ and allow Him to dwell in them have faith. The human eye, which would otherwise be an empty vessel, fills to overflowing with love. The Christ was able to provide such a great example of, quote, healing through words, close quote, because He was the first to set the, quote, wheel of love, Close quote, not the quote, wheel of the law close quote, in motion as an independent faculty and power of the human soul because he was so filled with love that it spilled over healing those around him and because the words he spoke whether rise and walk or your sins are forgiven you emerged from the abundant love overflowing within him 
from an excess of love that an I could not contain. When the Christ spoke of believers, he meant anyone who internalized the reality of this love to even a slight extent. This is the only meaning we must associate with the term faith, which is one of the most significant in the New Testament. Faith is the ability to transcend oneself, to go beyond what the eye does for the sake of its own perfection. Thus, once the Christ had incarnated into the body of the Nathanic Jesus, where he united with the power of the Buddha, his teachings did not answer the question, quote, How is the eye to become as perfect as possible? Close quote but rather, quote, how shall the I overflow? How can it transcend itself? Close quote. He often answered in simple words, and indeed the words of the Luke Gospel speak to the simplest hearts. It is not enough to give to those who will give back to you, for even sinners do that. If they know that they will get back what they have given, they do not give out of overflowing love. But when you give and know that you will not receive in return, you have acted out of real love. Luke 6, 34 This love is not contained by the I, but flows freely from it. In many different variations on these words, the Christ described how the I is meant to overflow, working in the world through its excess, through self-transcendent feeling. The warmest words in the Luke Gospel speak of overflowing love. The Luke Gospel contains a force of overflowing love that permeates our own words with its strength so that they can affect the outer world. One of the other evangelists whose prior experience did not allow him to emphasize overflowing love to the same extent, at least briefly summed up this Christian mystery saying that love flows from the overfulness of the I. Of course, it must also flow into all our words and deeds. The Latin translation of the Matthew Gospel still contains authentic original wording that briefly summarizes the Luke Gospel's beautiful phrase of love, ex abundantia cordis os loquitur, quote, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, close quote. Luke 6.45, Matthew 12.34 One of the highest Christian ideals. The mouth speaks out of the heart's abundance, out of the fullness that the heart cannot contain. The heart is moved by blood, and blood is the expression of the eye. Thus this sentence means, quote, Speak from an overflowing eye that radiates strength, for this strength is the power of faith. Close quote. Then your words truly contain the power of the Christ. Quote, the mouth speaks out of the heart's abundance, close quote, is a cardinal statement of the essence of Christianity. And now read the same sentence in the modern German Bible, quote, whose heart is full, his mouth shall overflow. Close quote. These words have sufficed for centuries to conceal one of the cardinal principles of Christianity. Humankind has never recognized what nonsense it is to say that a full heart pours itself out. In the ordinary world, things spill only when they are more than full, when they overflow. Of necessity, and this is not meant as criticism, humankind has been caught up in an idea that completely conceals one of the most important precepts of Christianity, without even noticing that it is replaced by a sheer impossibility. If our language will not tolerate translating ex abundantia cordis as os loquitur as, quote, the mouth speaks out of the heart's overfulness, close quote, then we also cannot say that the overflow from a masonry stove heats the room, which is sheer nonsense. If you heat a stove only until the warmth reaches its walls, it does not warm the room. 
The room is warmed only when warmth exceeds the stove's capacity to contain it. This is an important issue. Part of the Luke Gospel is based on a cardinal Christian precept that has been covered up. At an important point, we cannot see what the Gospel says. The force that overflows from the human heart, which in this context means the human eye, is the power of the Christ. The eye creates an excess that cannot be contained and flows out through the Word. Only at the end of the earth phase of evolution will the eye fully incorporate the Christ. Meanwhile, the Christ is what overflows from human hearts. If our hearts are merely full, we do not incorporate the Christ. That is why Christianity is covered up when the full earnestness and dignity of this verse are not understood. The most important aspect of Christianity, its very essence, appears correctly when spiritual science explains lofty Christian documents. Through reading the Akashic record in the spiritual world, spiritual science uncovers the original meaning of such documents and is therefore able to read the truth in them. Now we understand how humankind moves toward the future. The Bodhisattva, who became the Buddha five or six centuries before Christ, ascended into the spiritual world to work through a Nirmanakaya. By doing so, he rose to a higher level. He no longer needed to descend into a physical body and now works in other ways. When he became the Buddha, he passed the office of Bodhisattva to a different being who was to be his successor. Esoteric Christianity recognizes the profound truth of the Buddhist legend that tells how the Bodhisattva being, before descending into incarnation as the Buddha, took off the heavenly diadem and placed it on the head of the next Bodhisattva, who will continue their common efforts, but with a somewhat different mission. He too is destined to become a Buddha. Approximately 3,000 years from now, when a number of people have discovered and followed the Eightfold Path out of their own resources, the Bodhisattva who succeeded the Buddha will also become a Buddha. This Bodhisattva was entrusted with his mission five or six hundred years before the beginning of our era and will become a Buddha approximately 3,000 years from now. Oriental teachings call this being the Maitreya Buddha. Before the present Bodhisattva can become the Maitreya Buddha, a large number of human beings must have discovered the teaching of the Eightfold Path in their own hearts. By then many people will be wise enough to do so. At that time, the present Bodhisattva will introduce a new force into the world. If nothing else happened in the intervening time, the Bodhisattva would still find individuals capable of discovering the teaching of the Eightfold Path through inner meditation. But he would not find, the, find individuals whose souls overflow with the living force of love. In the interim, this living force of love must stream in so that the Maitreya Buddha finds individuals who not only know what love is, but also incorporate the power of love itself. To this end, the Christ had to descend to earth. He spent only three years on earth and had not incarnated previously, as you can gather from all of my earlier explanations. The Christ's three-year presence on earth, from the baptism in the Jordan to the mystery of Golgotha, will cause love to flow into human hearts and souls on earth, in other words, into the human eye, to an ever-increasing extent. Human beings will become increasingly imbued with the Christ until at the end of the earth phase of evolution He totally fills the human eye. Just as the doctrine of compassion and love first had to be stimulated by the Buddha, the substance of love had to be brought to earth from heavenly heights 
by a being who would gradually transform it into the personal possession of each human eye. It is not correct to say that love did not exist previously, but earlier love could not be direct and the direct and personal possession of the human eye. Earlier love was inspired love, love sent down from cosmic heights by the Christ. It flowed into human beings as unconsciously as the teachings of the Eightfold Path flowed from the Bodhisattva before he became the Buddha. The Buddha embodied the Eightfold Path as the Christ being embodied the previously undescended Christ essence. It is essential to note that for the Christ, assuming human form was a progressive step. The Buddha's successor, who is now a Bodhisattva and will become the Maitreya Buddha, is well known to those familiar with spiritual science. In time it will become possible to identify this Bodhisattva by name. For now, however, having stated so many facts that are unknown to the outer world, we can only say that he exists. When he appears on earth as the Maitreya Buddha, he will encounter the Christ's seeds, that is, human beings whose heads are not only full of the wisdom of the Eightfold Path and with teachings of love, but whose hearts are full of the living substance of love that overflows and streams out into the world. Together with these individuals, the Maitreya Buddha will then accomplish his further mission as cosmic evolution continues. We must understand such relationships in order to understand the profundity of the Luke Gospel. This Gospel does not tell us about doctrines. It tells of the being who imbued earthly existence and human constitutions with his own substance. Esotericism expresses this fact by saying that the Bodhisattvas who become Buddhas save the human spirit through their wisdom but can never save the entire human being. To save the entire human being, not only wisdom but also the warm power of love must flood the entire human constitution. Christ's task was to save souls through the flood of love he brought to earth. We must distinguish between the task of the Bodhisattva and Buddha, which was to introduce humankind to the wisdom or knowledge of love, and the task of the Christ, which was to introduce the power of love. The end of Lecture 9, given in Basel on September 25, 1909. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled According to Luke. Uh, it, this is the last lecture in the series, the cycle, uh, Lecture 10, and it's entitled The Mystery of Golgotha as a New Form of Initiation. Today we will see how the insights we have gained here lead us to the so-called Mystery of Golgotha which is revealed by spiritual research into the Luke Gospel. Yesterday we attempted to vividly depict what was happening in the evolution of the human race during the Christ's three years on earth, while previous lectures showed how the confluence of several spiritual currents allowed this mysterious event to occur. Insights gained from the Akashic Record reveal the full value of Gospel accounts, especially of Luke the Evangelist's description of the Christ's earthly mission. At this point, a question may arise. If in fact the Buddhist spiritual current was organically interwoven with Christianity, why is there no sign in Christian teachings of the great law of karma? of the compensation that occurs over several incarnations of the same individuality. We would be mistaken to believe that the Luke Gospel does not include insights based on the law of karma. We must realize, however, that the needs of the human soul change in the course of history. 
the great missionaries of world evolution, who must meet these needs in any given epoch, cannot simply promulgate absolute truths in abstract forms that would be comprehensible to their contemporaries at that level of maturity. The great Buddha's incisive gift to humankind included insights that lead when combined with the Eightfold Path's doctrine of compassion and love to an understanding of the doctrine of karma. We cannot expect to find this understanding in human souls who have not had time to develop it. We heard yesterday that in 3,000 years a large percentage of human beings will be sufficiently advanced to discover the Eightfold Path within themselves. Today we can add that these individuals will also discover, albeit very gradually, the truths of reincarnation and karma. When a seed first sprouts, flowers do not develop immediately but only after the leaves emerge in lawful succession. Similarly, spiritual evolution moves through different levels in human history, and each successive phenomenon occurs at the right time. Today, the faculties we achieve through spiritual science allow us to discover the unavoidable truths of reincarnation and karma by meditating on our own souls. Earlier stages in the evolution of the human soul were not fruitless, but produced the level of maturity necessary for this step. It would have been pointless to proclaim the doctrine of reincarnation and karma exoterically several centuries ago. Today human souls long for the contents of modern spiritual science and the results of its research into the foundations of the Gospels. But the evolution of the human race would not have been advanced by publicizing these contents several hundred years ago. Before they could be presented, human souls had to hunger for them. Experiences in earlier pre-Christian and Christian incarnations developed the faculties needed to absorb the truths of karma and reincarnation. In the context of the evolution of the human race, proclaiming these truths as openly in the first centuries of Christianity as we do today would have been like asking a plant to produce flowers before it develops leaves. Humankind has only recently matured sufficiently to begin absorbing the spiritual truths of karma and reincarnation. It is not surprising, therefore, that some passages in the Gospels have survived in forms that actually give a false picture of Christianity. In some respects, the Gospels were given to humankind prematurely, and we are only now developing the faculties that allow us to understand their true meaning. The coming of Christ Jesus had to be proclaimed in ways that respected the human soul constitution typical at that time. Reincarnation and karma could not be taught abstractly, but only by imbuing human souls with feelings that allowed them to develop the necessary maturity to absorb these truths. In other words, reincarnation and karma could not be taught directly at that time. The most that could be done was to plant the seed of future understanding. Is that what Christ Jesus and his followers said? Let's open the Luke Gospel and allow their words to flow into our souls. If we do so with the right insight, we will see how they introduced the law of karma. Quote, Blessed are you, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you that hunger now for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and cast out your name as evil, on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, 
your reward is great in heaven. Close quote Luke 6, 20-23 Stated in this way, the law of compensation, instead of referring abstractly to reincarnation and karma, imbued human souls with the certainty that those who hunger will be compensated. Such feelings had to flow into human souls who would achieve the maturity needed to understand karma and reincarnation only in subsequent incarnations. Souls of that time had to receive a content that would mature in them later. A new age had arrived, a time when the human race was mature enough to begin to develop the I or self-awareness. Previously, Human beings had experienced the effects of revelations in their astral, etheric, and physical bodies. But now the eye was to become fully conscious, although it would only gradually be filled with the forces it was to receive. At that time only a single eye on earth, the eye of the Nathanic Jesus, whose physical nature had been prepared to embody the individuality of Zarathustra, was able to fully incorporate the all-encompassing Christ principle into an earthly personality. Now others, by emulating the Christ, must gradually incorporate this principle, which was once present in an earthly human being for three years. Christ Jesus provided no more than a stimulus for humankind. He planted a seed that must now gradually sprout and grow. The Christ also ensured that at appropriate intervals in human evolution, individuals appeared to supply elements that others would only later be able to develop independently. The being who walked the earth as the Christ had to ensure not only the immediate proclamation of his incarnation in ways that his contemporaries understood, but also the later appearance of individuals who would provide spiritual care for maturing souls. The author of the John Gospel describes the Christ's provisions for the times following the event of Golgotha. The Christ resurrected the individuality of John the Baptist in Lazarus to continue John's work of spreading the Christ's teachings in the form I described in lectures on the John Gospel and to ensure the later coming of another individuality who would provide the maturing human race with a necessary element, the Christ had to perform a second resurrection. This awakening from the dead is faithfully described by the author of the Luke Gospel, whose stated intent was to describe what imaginative and inspired clairvoyance knew about the event of Palestine. The resurrection of the young man of Nain, Luke 7, 11 to 17, contains the mystery of the continued effects of Christianity. The mysteries associated with the healing of Jairus' daughter, which I explained at least partially the day before yesterday, were so profound that Christ Jesus took only a few people with him to witness the healing, and then told them not to talk about it. In contrast, the story of the resurrection of the young man of Nain was publicized immediately. The former was an instance of healing that resulted from a profound understanding of the physical body's processes, while the latter was an awakening or initiation. The individuality who inhabited the body of the young man of Nain was destined to experience a very specific type of initiation. In one type of initiation, the higher worlds are illumined for the person in question as soon as the initiation process is completed and the new initiate is immediately able to understand spiritual laws and processes. A different type of initiation merely plants a seed in the soul of the candidate who becomes an initiate 
only when the seed begins to develop in a subsequent incarnation. The young man of Nain underwent the latter type of initiation. His soul, transformed during the event of Palestine, was not yet conscious of ascending into higher worlds. The forces implanted in his soul germinated only in his next incarnation. In an exoteric lecture I cannot identify this individuality by name, but I can say that these forces made him a great religious teacher in a later life. Thus the Christ ensured the later appearance of an individuality who would advance Christianity. The, individual, the individuality resurrected in the young man of Nain was charged with introducing the teachings of reincarnation and karma into Christianity at a later time. When the Christ walked the earth, these truths could not be proclaimed directly because a feeling for them first had to be implanted in human souls. In the Luke Gospel's account of his life, Christ Jesus clearly indicates that the new element of I consciousness has entered human evolution. We must simply understand what we read. The Christ tells us that in earlier times the spiritual world did not flow into the self-aware human I, but only into human physical, etheric and astral bodies. In other words, a degree of unconsciousness was always necessary for divine spiritual forces to flow into human beings. This state of affairs, however, was meant to change. The Christ was born into the spiritual tradition of the Law of Moses, which addressed only the human astral body. That is, although the Law worked in human beings, it did not work directly out of the forces of the I. These forces became possible only in Christ Jesus' time, when individuals first became conscious of the I. Christ Jesus points to this phenomenon in the Luke Gospel when he speaks of John the Baptist as his forerunner in Luke 7, 18-35, in Luke 1, 16-17, End of, footnote, uh, end of references. He says that to receive a completely new principle, people's souls must first become fully mature. How did the Christ himself view the individuality of John? He saw John as the last to proclaim the best aspects of the past, the purest, noblest form of the teachings of the ancient prophets. The Law and the Prophets culminate in John, whose task was to present his contemporaries with the gifts of old teachings and old soul contents for one final time before the appearance of the Christ. How had these soul contents worked before the Christ principle entered human evolution? At this point we encounter a phenomenon that the natural sciences would find very strange today, but will one day incorporate when they have accepted a bit of inspiration from spiritual science. This subject, which I can touch on only briefly here, will demonstrate how profoundly spiritual science will illuminate the natural sciences. Modern biology, in an attempt to apply the limited faculties of human thinking to explaining the mysteries of human existence, describes how the interaction of male and female germ cells produces a supposedly complete human being. One of the fundamental efforts of modern biology is to prove that an entire human being emerges from this interaction. Cellular substances are examined under the microscope in attempts to determine which characteristics originate in the male gamete and which in the female. However, progress in the field of biology will force it to acknowledge that at our present evolutionary level only part of the human constitution 
is determined by the interaction of male and female gametes, and that as a rule this interaction does not explain the entire individual, regardless of how exactly we can determine which characteristics come from which gamete. Each human being contains a virginal element, as it were, which is not stimulated by the fusion of gametes, but originates in completely different domains of existence. This element, which unites with a human embryo at conception, does not come from either of the parents, yet it belongs to and is destined for that specific individual. It pours into the eye and can be ennobled by receiving the Christ principle, and its birth is virginal. Biological methods will eventually confirm the relationship between this element and the significant transition that occurred at the time of Christ Jesus. Previously, the inner aspect of the individual contained nothing that did not enter via the embryo. But meanwhile, changes have occurred in the evolution of the I, again capital. Since that time, the human race has changed. A new element has been added to the embryo's makeup, an element that we must now gradually develop and ennoble by receiving the Christ principle. We are approaching a very subtle truth. For those familiar with modern natural science, it is both strange and interesting to note that already today, researchers in certain fields confront the fact that a certain aspect of the human being does not originate in the embryo. But their intellects are not sufficiently advanced to acknowledge the full significance of their experimental observations. Objectively speaking, modern science does not recognize certain elements that influence its experiments. Science would make little progress if it depended exclusively on the skill of laboratory technicians or clinical researchers, but behind them stand the guiding forces of the world, allowing elements to surface that the researchers are instrumental in revealing but do not understand. Even objective research is guided by the, in quotes, masters, that is, by more advanced individualities. Although this state of affairs will remain unrecognized until researchers' conscious faculties become imbued with anthroposophical spiritual teachings. With the addition of this new element at the time of the Christ's appearance on earth, human faculties underwent a great change. Previously, incarnated human beings had access only to abilities that originated in their paternal and maternal gametes, for only such faculties develop within the human being on the basis of our physical, etheric, and astral bodies. Before the time of Christ Jesus, the tools available to us developed exclusively from the embryo, while afterward a virginal element not stimulated by the embryo was added. If we succumb completely to a merely materialistic perspective, of course this element is degraded, but it can be ennobled and transferred to successive incarnations in an ever more advanced form if we surrender to the warmth emanating from the Christ principle. What I have just said, however, presupposes that we understand two important points namely, that all revelations before the time of the Christ were in some way bound to inherited faculties present in the embryo, and that Christ Jesus had to address faculties related to the seed from the divine worlds rather than to the earthly embryo. All the advanced individualities, whether prophets or bodhisattvas, who spoke to human beings before the appearance of Christ Jesus, 
had to use faculties transmitted to them through embryonic potentials. Christ Jesus, however, speaks to the aspect of the human being that does not pass through the embryo, but originates in divine realms. That is what he means when he says to his disciples of John the Baptist, quote, I tell you, among those born of woman, none is greater than John, and yet the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Close quote, Luke 7.28 That is, John is the greatest of those whose entire being can be explained on the basis of physical birth and male and female gametes. But even the smallest portion of the element that is not, quote, born of woman, close quote, but enters the human being from the kingdom of God is greater than John. Great profundities are concealed in such words. If we allow the essence of spiritual science to illumine our study of the Bible, we will rec realize that the Bible contains physiological truths that are greater than any discoveries of bungling modern physiology. A verse such as the above is a stimulus to recognizing a great physiological fact. When we truly understand the Bible, profound truths are revealed. Christ Jesus offers many different examples of the new element he introduced. He pointed out that this element is totally different from all previous revelations because it is proclaimed through faculties that are not inherited but born out of the kingdom of heaven. He indicates how difficult it is for people to gradually rise to a level that allows them to understand the teachings of the gospel. People want to be persuaded and convinced in the same old ways, but the Christ immediately tells them that the old ways cannot convince them of new truths. A new testimony to the Spirit is required and the sign of the ancient form of initiation, the sign of Jonah, says nothing about the new form. The sign of Jonah symbolized in the old way the gradual increase in knowledge that allowed individuals to become initiates, or to use the biblical term, prophets, Luke 11, 29-32. The ancient method of initiation into the spiritual world involved preparing one's soul to the appropriate level of maturity before spending three and a half days in a state of complete withdrawal from the outer world and the sensory tools used to perceive it. Candidates for initiation were first carefully trained. Their souls were prepared to understand the life of the Spirit. Then they were taken to a place where, for three and a half days, their outer senses could perceive nothing, and they retreated from the world. A state resembling bodily death was induced in them. Their souls were cut off from the outer world and led into a completely different world. After three and a half days they were reawakened, that is, their souls were called back into their bodies. Such people were then able to remember and communicate their perceptions of the higher worlds. All ethnic groups included individuals who were then able to impart information about the spiritual world because they had undergone the experience described in the Bible as Jonah's sojourn in the whale. Jonah 2.1 In ancient times, individuals were carefully prepared for this experience. And when they reappeared to their people, they bore the mark of Jonah to indicate their direct perception of the spiritual world. This was the form of ancient initiation the Christ referred to when he said that the only sign given would be the sign of Jonah. Luke 11.29 The next verses in the Luke Gospel also describe a second ancient form of initiation. As a legacy of ancient times, some people still became dimly clairvoyant 
and were guided into the spiritual world through revelation from above, without any effort or activity on their part. Although initiates of this second type lived among ordinary people, their heredity permitted them to receive revelations from above in an enhanced trance-like state without first undergoing a specific initiation process. The Christ pointed out that both types of initiation into the spiritual world had come down from the past. He reminded his listeners about King Solomon as an example of an untrained individual who beheld the spiritual world through revelations from above. Thus the Queen of Sheba, who visited King Solomon, is the bearer of wisdom from above, the representative of all those predestined to possess dim hereditary remnants of the clairvoyance that had been widespread in Atlantean times. Luke 11.31 Solomon and the symbolic visit of the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of the South, represent one type of initiation. The other type which took place under the sign of Jonah involved withdrawing totally from the outer world for three and a half days to travel through the spiritual world. After referring to these two types of initiation, the Christ added, quote, And behold, something greater than Solomon is here, close quote, and quote, something greater than Jonah is here, close quote, Luke 11, 31 and 32. Pointing out a new element of divine revelation that does not simply speak to the human ether body from outside, as in Solomon's case, or from within via a suitably prepared astral body, as in Jonah's case. The new element, the virginal aspect of the human soul, belongs to the kingdom of heaven and unites with the forces of that kingdom when the human eye becomes sufficiently mature. Human beings can degrade this aspect by repudiating the Christ principle, but can foster and encourage it by imbuing themselves with what emanates from the Christ principle. The teachings of Christ Jesus, as described in the Luke Gospel, incorporated a new element as we see, all the old ways of revealing the kingdom of heaven were changed by the event of Palestine. That is why the Christ told those who, at, who were at least somewhat prepared to understand him that they would not see the kingdom of heaven simply through revelation, like Solomon, or through initiation under the sign of Jonah. If that was all they achieved, they would die before seeing the kingdom of God in this incarnation. In other words, without being initiated, they would not see the kingdom of God before dying. But in order to be initiated, they would have to undergo a death-like state. The Christ also meant to show, however, that the new element that had entered the world would now enable some people to see the kingdom of heaven before they died. In a wonderful passage in the Luke Gospel, the Christ speaks of a higher form of revelation. Quote, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Close quote, Luke 9.27 Initially, the disciples did not understand the implications of this statement. They did not understand that those standing around the Christ had been chosen to experience the powerful effect of His eye, of the Christ principle, which would enable them to ascend directly into the spiritual world. He meant, however, that they themselves would experience the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven before undergoing either natural death or the death of initiation. The spiritual world was to be revealed to them without either the sign of Solomon or the sign of Jonah. Did that indeed happen? This passage is followed immediately by the scene of Christ's transfiguration. 
he led three disciples, Peter, James, and John, up into the spiritual world, where they encountered the spiritual beings, not only of Moses and Elijah, but also of Christ Jesus himself, Luke 9, 28-36. For a moment the disciples beheld the spiritual world, and learned that it was possible to do so in a third way, without the sign of Solomon or the sign of Jonah. It was also apparent, however, that they were still beginners, for they were immediately torn out of their physical and etheric bodies by the sheer power of the event. That is why the Christ found them sleeping. This passage demonstrates a new third way of entering the spiritual world, and tells those who can read the signs of the times that the human eye has evolved and can now be directly inspired and influenced by divine forces. At the same time, however, this passage shows that even the most advanced of the Christ's contemporaries were still were, were not able to receive the Christ principle completely. Their first actions after the transfiguration immediately proved their inability. Their forces failed them when they attempted to heal a boy possessed by an evil spirit. They could not do it. The Christ pointed out that they were only in the initial stages of developing this ability and told them that he would have to remain with them for a long time before they would fully acquire it. Luke 9.41 He then healed the boy the disciples could not heal. Pointing again to the great mystery of his incarnation, he said to them, quote, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. Close quote. That is, the time has come for the ultimate accomplishment of human beings during the earthly phase of evolution to begin to be accessible to all. The time has come for human beings to receive the eye and recognize its highest manifestation in the Christ. Quote, Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men. Close quote. But they did not understand this saying, continue quote, and it was concealed from them that they should not perceive it. Close final quote, Luke 9, 44-45. How many people today have understood this passage? Not many. But as time passes, more and more people will understand that the I, the Son of Man, must be surrendered to human beings. In the next story in the Luke Gospel, the Christ adds an explanation couched in terms suitable for his contemporaries. Quote, and an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Close quote. That is, who was most suited to receive the Christ principle. Quote, but when Jesus perceived the thought of their hearts, he took a child and put him by his side and said to them, sub quote, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Close quote. Close total quote, Luke 9, 46, 48. That is, receives the one who sent this part of the human being to earth. The esoteric meaning of this passage, emphasizing the importance of fostering the childlike aspect of human nature, is that human beings today are the product of ancient forces that worked when Luciferic beings had not yet invaded human beings. The Luciferic forces later concealed themselves in the faculties that modern human beings possess. In everything that originates in the embryo, human consciousness mingles with Luciferic forces that pull human beings down to a lower level. The consciousness human beings developed prior to the Christ's appearance was totally pervaded with Luciferic forces remaining from earlier times. The unconscious which dates back to evolution on Saturn, Sun, and Moon, when no Luciferic forces were present, is the virginal element, which unites with the human being only when individuals cultivate the Christ principle within themselves. 
Every human being we encounter today is the result of heredity, of a confluence of elements from parental germ cells, and is thus an intrinsically twofold being. This twofoldness has been pervaded by Luciferic forces. Until individuals are fully illumined by self-awareness, until they can distinguish between good and evil from within the I, their earlier original nature is visible through the veil of later degradation. Only the childlike element in modern human beings preserves a remnant of human nature as it was before we succumbed to the influence of Luciferic beings. Thus, in the human beings we encounter now, we find a childlike part and an adult part, as it were, although the adult part, which is pervaded by Luciferic forces, asserts itself from the very beginning of embryonic development. Because even children are already imbued with Luciferic forces, the pre-Luciferic element is not evident in ordinary life. It must be resurrected by the power of the Christ, which unites with the best forces of our original childlike nature. This power cannot unite with degraded faculties, with the products of merely intellectual knowledge. It must unite with the best aspect of human nature, with the childlike remnant that persists from ancient times. It regenerates this remnant first as a starting point for revivifying the rest of the human being. As modern human beings, we may possess excellent potentials. We may develop these potentials and make good progress on the level of ordinary life. We typically do not consider the unconscious, however, and it is important to consider this childlike element because it provides an initial point of entry for the Christ faculty, which re-enlivens all our other faculties. We must begin by making this childlike element wise and then move on to make our other faculties wise again. In this respect, each of us carries a childlike nature within us which, when it becomes active, is receptive to uniting with the Christ principle. In contrast, if only Luciferic forces are at work in us, no matter how exalted they may be, they will deny and mock the Christ force that manifests in earthly life, as the Christ himself predicted. The Luke Gospel clearly presents the meaning of the new revelation. In ancient times, only those who had been taught to recognize the mark of Jonah knew that the initiates who bore that sign could convey information about the spiritual world. Specific preparation was required to recognize the mark of Jonah or the mark of Solomon. Now a new preparation is needed to produce a new type of understanding and a new way of maturing the soul. Initially, the contemporaries of Christ Jesus were only able to understand the old, familiar way presented by John the Baptist. People were alienated by Christ Jesus' completely new way and by his selection of souls who did not look like traditional candidates for initiation. People assumed that Christ Jesus would preach to those involved in traditional practices and could not understand why he sat with people whom they considered sinners. But he said, quote, if I used, well, not, not a quote, but he said, if I used old forms to present the new element I am bringing to humankind, instead of replacing the old forms with new ones, that would be like patching an old cloak with a piece of new cloth or putting new wine in old wineskins. Humankind must receive this new element which is more than the marks of Solomon or Jonah, in new wineskins and new forms. You must brace yourselves to receive the new proclamation. That's a paraphrase of Luke 5, 36 and 37. Traditional learning did not allow Christ Jesus' contemporaries 
to understand this message. It can be understood only through the mighty influence of the I, through the element that flowed into human beings from the spiritual being of the Christ. Those destined to receive this element were not the students of old traditional teachings, but those who had undergone incarnation after incarnation, yet remained simple people, who understood through the power of faith that flowed into them. These people also had to be given a sign, a sign for all eyes to see. The mystic death initiate, initiates had undergone let me read that again. The mystic death initiates had undergone for millennia in the mystery temples had to be replayed on the great stage of world history. The mysteries emerged from the great initiation temples and were played out in a single event on Golgotha, a mighty public representation of what initiates alone once witnessed during the three and a half days of ancient initiation rites. Knowledgeable people recognize the event of Golgotha as an initiation transferred to the stage of world history. Formerly, candidates for initiation spent three and a half days in a state of death-like repose that convinced them that the spirit will always overcome bodily nature and that the human soul and spirit belong to a spiritual world. This process formerly witnessed only by the few, by initiates in the mystery temples, was now played out in public for all the world to see. The event of Golgotha was an initiation rite performed not in an intimate setting for a few close witnesses, but on the stage of world history for all of humankind to see. From the drops of blood that fell from Christ Jesus' wounds as he hung on the cross on Golgotha, a stream of spiritual life flows into all human beings. The wisdom that once flowed from other messengers of the spiritual world now flows into humankind as a living force. This is the great difference between the event of Golgotha and the teachings of other religions. Correctly interpreting what happened on Golgotha requires a more profound understanding than exists today. At the beginning of the earth phase of evolution, the human eye was linked to the physical substance of the blood. Blood is the outer expression of the human eye. If the Christ had not appeared, human beings would have continued to strengthen the eye and would have devolved into egotism. This was prevented by the event of Golgotha. Blood, the excess substance of the eye, had to be shed. This process began when the sweat fell from the Redeemer's brow like drops of blood on the Mount of Olives, and continued when the blood flowed from his wounds on Golgotha. This blood was a sign of the need to sacrifice excess egotism in human nature. That is why we must investigate the spiritual significance of the Christ's sacrifice on Golgotha on a more profound level. The truth of what happened on Golgotha is not apparent to chemistry or to a superficial intellectual view. Chemical analysis of the blood that flowed on Golgotha would reveal the same substances that other human blood contains, but esoteric methods reveal that this blood is different. It is the excess that would have led human beings into egotism if infinite love had not appeared and allowed this blood to flow. Esoteric research reveals that infinite love mingles with this blood, completely pervading it. Each evangelist has a particular role and a particular emphasis, and the author of the Luke Gospel was especially concerned with depicting the infinite love that flowed into the world through the Christ and will gradually drive out egotism. If we could illuminate the esoteric connections among the Gospels on a more profound level, 
we would find that these connections resolve all the seeming contradictions discovered by materialistic research. Just as the contradictions in the Gospel accounts of the early years of Jesus of Nazareth are resolved when we learn the facts of his childhood. Each of the evangelists described what was most obvious to his own perspective. Hence Luke described what his sources, quote, independent seers, close quote, and quote, servants of the word, close quote, were specially trained to perceive. The other evangelists perceived other aspects of the life of Christ Jesus. But the author of the Luke Gospel perceived the outpouring of love that forgives even the most terrible offense in the physical world. The words that resound from the cross on Golgotha express this ideal love. Quote, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Close quote, Luke 23, 34. This infinite love that forgives even the ultimate offense becomes a reality when Christ Jesus, hanging on the cross on Golgotha, begs forgiveness for his crucifiers. The Luke Gospel is also the gospel of the power of faith. It emphasizes that human nature includes an outpouring element whose purpose is to extricate individuals from the sensory world, regardless of how deeply they are entwined in it. Imagine individuals who have grown one with the sensory world through all sorts of crimes and have been punished by the courts of the physical world. Let's imagine that one such individual has preserved the germ of the power of faith, while another has not. This is the difference between the two criminals crucified with Christ Jesus. One had no faith and his sentence was executed. The other, however, retained a faint glimmer of faith that illumined the spiritual world so that he could not lose his connection to it. This is why the Christ says to him, quote, Truly I say to you today, close quote, since you recognize your connection to the spiritual world, quote again, you will be with me in paradise, close quote, Luke 23, 34. In the Luke Gospel, therefore, the truths that resound from the cross include faith and hope as well as love. One thing remains to be achieved in the soul domain emphasized by the author of the Luke Gospel imbued with the love that streams down from the cross on Golgotha, we can see into the future. We realize that as the earth phase of evolution progresses, the spirit in human beings must gradually transform all of physical, earthly existence. The Father Principle that we received before the Luciferic influence began will gradually recede, but we will allow our whole spirit to be pervaded by the Christ principle, and our hands will express clear images that live in our souls. Our hands were created not by us, but by the Father principle, and in the future they will be imbued with the Christ principle. As we pass from incarnation to incarnation, our accomplishments in the physical body will incorporate the spiritual element that flows from the mystery of Golgotha into the Father Principle, that is, the Christ Principle that pervades the outer world. We will emulate the composure streaming down from the cross on Golgotha, which becomes the highest hope and ideal for the future. I allow faith and love to sprout within me. They will live and grow in me. When they grow strong enough, they will pervade my entire physical aspect, the Father Principle within me. Hope for our human future will be added to faith and love, and human beings will acquire the composure needed to face the future. If I have faith and love, I may hope that the Christ in me will gradually flow outward then human beings will understand the great ideal of the words that resounded from the cross, quote, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, close quote, Luke 23, 46. Words of love, faith, and hope resound from the cross in the gospel that describes the confluence 
of previously separate spiritual currents in the soul of Jesus of Nazareth. The great Christ ideal streamed into mere knowledge and transformed it into a soul force. The human soul's task is to gain an ever better understanding of what the Luke Gospel reveals, an understanding that will increasingly enliven the three ideals resounding from the cross. The faculties that spiritual scientific truths foster in us allow us to experience the words resounding from the cross as a living proclamation rather than as mere dead words. We begin to understand that religious documents such as the Luke Gospel conceal a living word that spiritual science must gradually reveal. In this lecture cycle, we attempted to fathom as much as possible of the profound meaning of the Luke Gospel. Of course, a single lecture series cannot reveal all aspects of a document with such universal content, and much must remain unexplained. If you follow the path outlined in this cycle, however, you will discover ever more profound truths, and your souls will become increasingly receptive to the living word concealed behind the outer words. Spiritual science or theosophy is not a new doctrine. It is a tool for understanding what humankind is given at any point in time. At the moment, spiritual science is a tool for understanding the religious documents of Christian revelation. If you see anthroposophical spiritual science in this light, you will no longer call it Christian theosophy or a different form of theosophy. There is only one theosophy, one spiritual science, one single tool for revealing the truth. We use this tool to unearth the treasures of humankind's spiritual life. Spiritual science is the tool for unearthing the treasures of the Bhagavad Gita in one instance and of the Luke Gospel in another. The greatness of the spiritual scientific movement lies in its ability to plumb to the depths any of the Spirit's gifts to humankind, and we would misunderstand it if we closed our minds to any of the various revelations that have been proclaimed to human beings throughout the ages. I hope you will receive the proclamation of the Luke Gospel in this sense and understand how completely it is pervaded by the inspiration of love. If you do, the insight into this Gospel that spiritual science provides will continue to grow in your souls and will help to illumine not only the mysteries of the periphery, that is, the spiritual foundations of existence, but also the meaning of those very fundamental words, quote, peace in human hearts, in whom goodwill dwells, close quote. More than any other document, the Luke Gospel, if fully understood, fills human souls with the warm love that allows peace to dwell on earth as the most exquisite reflection of divine mysteries. Revelations must be reflected on earth reflected back into the spiritual heights. If we acknowledge spiritual science in this sense, it will reveal the mysteries of divine spiritual beings and spiritual existence, and the reflection of these revelations will dwell in our souls as love and peace, the most exquisite earthly reflection of what streams down to us from the heights. This is the true significance of the words that resound in the Luke Gospel when the strength of the Buddha's Nirmanakaya pours into the Nathanic infant Jesus. Revelations from spiritual worlds stream down to earth and are reflected in human hearts as love and peace inasmuch as human beings evolve toward the goodwill that the Christ principle causes to unfold and flow from the human core the I. When we understand the Luke Gospel correctly, this message resounds both clearly and warmly from the words, quote, spiritual words, worlds are revealed from the heights and reflected back by human hearts, bringing peace to human beings on earth who freely choose to develop true goodwill in the course 
of the earth phase of evolution. Close quote. That's the end of Lecture 10 given in Basel on September 26, 1909, and that is the end of the lecture cycle according to Luke, the Gospel of Compassion and Love Revealed by Rudolf Steiner. This is a recording done in 2015, my new one. I hope uh, it's uh, better than the other one was. <laughs>